A little informality is good. <laughs> Your garden is so lovely oh, behind you. And then as yeah. Yeah, this is a good year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. The floor is yours. Oh, the floor is mine. Okay, I need to tell you that I'm having a very bad day today. So I've been through some kind of undiagnosed problem, and nobody can tell me what's wrong. And so I've been really not terribly good. So if I conk out in the middle of it, or if I don't make sense, let me know. <laughs> okay, now we are talking about forced migration. And that's something that affects individuals, families, children particularly, um, all kinds of groups of people. Some times are bad, and this time is particularly bad. I think the uh, Arab Spring has added to it. There is constant migration there. There's constant migration all over the world at the moment. Millions of people leave their homes, have to leave their homes. It's forced migration. It's not just going for a trip. So I'm going to talk about some of it, not about the mass migrations, because I don't really know very much about it. I read the papers, I know what's known, but... I don't know what the psychological, individual, emotional experience of those people is. But I know about other migrations, and I will talk about those, including some of my own, if you don't mind hearing about that. Um, I have an image in my head at the moment of a man having a little boy, seven years old, by the hand, and walking. And the little boy says, Why are we go where are we going, why are we going? And the father doesn't want particularly to explain pogroms and being killed because they are Jewish, and he doesn't know what to say to the child. And he just says, we have to go. And then the child says, why, why isn't mother with us? And he doesn't know what to say. But he would, what he thinks, what he uh, would like maybe to say, but decides it's not good for the child, is I have to get out of here. We are all in terrible danger. Maybe your mother is going to survive, but I have to go out and start a new family, I mean, bring the family out and start a new life where I don't have to be afraid every night. Okay, that's the individual experience of things like anti-Semitism. This was long before the Holocaust. But anti-Semitism was one of the causes for forced migration. Then there was the Holocaust, and people know about that, and they know most about it. But they don't know really how individuals reacted to the ones who made it out and who came to the States or, or went to England or went to Argentina or other places. And these are the really interesting psychological issues because what you have is a person who has escaped danger. Some of them were political persecution. Some of them, the Holocaust, of course, was a racial thing. Uh, but the fact is that whoever emigrates and lives in a new country, has to deal with a new culture, has to begin to deal with accepting the culture or not accepting it. And if you live in a new culture that you don't accept, 
there are obviously problems. You have in internal problems. You have no place where you feel at home. You have to do things or listen to things that you don't like. You have to maybe learn a new language. It's very stressful. It's incredibly stressful. Um, and it's stressful for children because they lose everything. They lose their complete environment. They lose their friends. They lose their school. They lose their games. Everything now is in a place that's different, very different. And what, what is less terrible about it? If you have been told why you had to leave your country, very many parents, unfortunately, don't tell the children one morning we pack our things and we go. And they have no idea why, and they lose everything. Mm -hmm. They lose their environment, they lose their school, they lose their friends, they lose their language very often. It's very traumatic, <clears throat> and it doesn't have to be. If the children are kept all the way through informed, if they know that it's dangerous to be in this country, for political reasons, for whatever. Uh, children will understand that. I never had one really hard time in my own experience of emigration. Mine was political. My parents got involved in starting the communist regime in Hungary in 19... Uh, 19, 1918, 1919, they were very much on top of the government. My father was the uh, foreign office person. My mother was the uh, interpreter for everybody that came in from other countries to see uh, us. Um, I was told everything. I knew everything. I knew I had read Marx at the age of nine. I was told about political differences. I was told, told about the fact that many other countries did not like the communist regime. Uh, I knew when the communist regime collapsed and people were arrested and killed and tortured. I knew all about that. I knew we had to leave. And I knew mostly that my parents had to leave because they were in real deadly danger. My own identity was very interesting. This all happened in Hungary. I started to hate Hungary. And I was told that I knew, I remembered, I was born in Switzerland. And so I decided I, I was Swiss. I got a big atlas. I remember sitting with the atlas and learning everything, teaching myself. I couldn't go to school because my father had been a communist. No school would accept me. So I sat with the, with the Swiss atlas, and I learned everything about Switzerland. And for a short time, I felt I was Swiss. My identity was Swiss. I hadn't lost an identity. I had a new identity, and I was pleased with it. While all this happened, while my parents had to get out, and getting out was very difficult, and we had to go, they had to go to Vienna. And there was some person who said he would smuggle them out of the country and get them to Vienna. Um, it was a little difficult. We were all terribly excited about that man, and he had to come. And every day we look out the window, and every day it got more dangerous. And we looked out the window. His name was Sam, and we sort of joked about the Samless Street. Um, finally he came, and 
put my parents on a boat, and the captain very generously offered uh, his cabin to my parents so that they would be invisible, and we sailed to Vienna. The fact that my mother had a miscarriage at that point wasn't wasn't sort of easy, but we finally arrived in Vienna without any funds, no money, Uh, some friends, some people, some relatives even. I was put into a boarding school. And that was not a good experience, but it was, I was alive, my parents were alive. Those were the things by which we measured uh, goodness or badness of life. Okay, the identity issue is a real complicated one because you are now living with other people, people who had other knowledge. And I had really a difficult time becoming an Austrian. Here I was in Vienna, beautiful place, lovely food, except it was after the war and there wasn't any food. I had a lot of good things happen. The boarding school was nice. There were other children, and there were other children from other parts of the world who had not necessarily lived through what I had. I had, there was a a French teacher and French, um, sort of, she, she was a, Everybody in that in that boarding school was sort of a half mother. She was French. She was very positive. She was very happy with life. She smelled wonderful. And French was a new language. No, it wasn't actually a new language. I had insisted on learning French at age seven because that was the only language left that I couldn't understand, and my parents wanted something that they could talk about things I shouldn't hear. (laughs) You probably all have had that experience, or close to it. But anyway, so I demanded to learn French, and I did, and they were left without a language (laughs) that that I couldn't understand when they talked, and that was very good, because... I really knew what was in their heads. I knew what they were concerned about. And I felt that I had a, my own identity was solid. That's very important. Identity and lost identity, of course, is one of the terrible items of forced migration. So keeping identity no matter what happens. It's a way of continue living and eventually getting over the losses and getting and enjoying the new life. I never quite felt like an Austrian. And as an adult, I was sort of thinking why I didn't. I was there, I joined the Girl Scouts, I had uh, everything. But uh, if you go through school, if you don't have the uh, essentially elementary school, you can't become a real, complete, identified citizen of the new country. It's the first four or five years of school that matter. If you don't have that, and I didn't have it in Vienna, I, was, I came to secondary school. My first class was Latin and everything else. So uh, history, geography, all of that, but not the Austrian original history, the, the stuff that other children learned about the country. I never could identify with that. Very interesting. I didn't have the 
early information about the country, about the habits, about the history, about all those things. So that's another issue that ha very often happens to children of forced migration. And you, you sort of have to... Well, you have an original identity. You have an ego. And that's what you live with. It works very really well. I never... Well, I don't know that I ever missed the first few years or not. But I had the great advantage that I was participating in everybody else's planning, thinking, knowledge. And I was... I felt I knew everything. And that was helpful. What people do who did not have to leave to save their lives immediately. But of course, uh, if you were a Jew and things were beginning to start all over, the Holocaust was beginning, you decided to leave. It was a decision. You could do it relatively comfortably. You could prepare. You could uh, decide where you are going. You'd, you had choices. So some of our friends were in that group. They had left, and they were now in, in uh, Vienna, and, they had, and then they came to the States. And they came to the States, and they came to Los Angeles, and we came to Los Angeles, my husband and I. And some of my husband's school friends were here. And so we occasionally met them. And one of the major problems was that they lived in Hollywood, and we lived in Santa Monica. And they were enraged at us for living in Santa Monica. <laughs> Santa Monica was really being an American. And they still maintained all of the customs of their Viennese life, of their real life, early life, the one that they left. They left because it was safe here, but they didn't really want to become part of America. So they lived in Hollywood, and they had an afternoon coffee every, every day, which is, was the custom to have coffee and cake in the afternoon. They continued that all the way through. Um, and they were enraged with us for living in Santa Monica. That was being an American. <laughs> well, it was. And, and we were. And we had no particular desire to have cake and coffee in the afternoon. <laughs> we were working in the afternoon. <laughs> there was one other thing that just escaped me. Oh, about identity. Uh, some immigrants emigrated only for material reasons. Life in America would be better, they would have more money, they would have jobs, they would have... Uh, but I remember my mother told me that she, when she um, was, was on the train to um, Cherbourg, where she was going to sail from, she talked to some people in the compartment. They were Hungarian. And my mother said, well, are you learning English? And the woman said, we don't need to know English. We are going to New York in a place where everybody speaks Hungarian. And as my mother said, well, what kind of place is that? Well, our relatives and our friends, and they are all there, and they speak Hungarian. There's a grocery on the corner, and there is everything. 
And the only trouble was the children had to go to school, and they had to eventually speak English. But other than that, the woman said, I don't have to learn English. I'll, I'll just speak Hungarian. I'll go to the grocery, I'll go to whatever, the market, the hunger. They all speak Hungary. <laughs> Hungarian. So no intention of any kind of real changing identity. Bringing the old identity to a place where it seems to be just like it was before. No change. It's very interesting because can you imagine living in the United States and not being able to speak any word of English? Part of uh, forced emigration. Why was it forced? Well, it was forced in a sense because many of the relatives were already here and because you could make more money. Poverty is a very powerful motivation for emigration. Uh, there are wonderful books uh, about Swedish emigrants who emigrated only because of the poverty. We don't think of Scandinavia as a poor place now, but uh, the end of last century it was terribly poor. And there's one tragic story where a Swedish family came to, I forget where they came to, but it was some American place. And the woman, the mother, cooked a big, big pot of oatmeal. And one of the children was so hungry that she ate almost all of it and then died because if you eat a whole big bowl meant for a whole family, but she was so hungry. So these were the tragic things that you couldn't really identify with, except there's something to avoid. But so immigration has a whole range of, in a way, some pleasant experiences, some very, very desperate and tragic experiences. One important thing is to explain to children what happens. That, I mean, if you work with families, if you work with, with children, be sure that there are no things that are kept from a child that's important, that affects the child. It's, uh, you know, parents are not very good about that usually. They, want, they don't want to upset the kids. They don't want to tell them anything that's bad. The child knows something is wrong. And what is wrong, they don't know enough about the world to, to even guess. So you've got to keep children informed, not only about immigration, but about what's going on. The Arab Spring, I hope people, children, know about it here. I hope parents talk about it. I hope they explain what's going on. Because sooner or later we are going to be in trouble. And then sudden decisions will have to be made. And the kids won't know. They won't understand. Tell them what's going on. Tell them in child's language, but tell them what's going on in the world. It's, it makes a tremendous difference. <clears throat> a child should be prepared for what's happening. You turn on the television, you think you are going to be in war tomorrow. It's a little scary if you don't know why and what and, and whether yes or no whether you have to think of changing something, whether you should begin to think of other countries, even if geography is not part of the curriculum. Ah, we can avoid a lot of pain and a lot of tragedy 
by keeping information going. This is the information period, but not only for adults. Include the kids. They'll have a better life, you'll have a better life. Okay, how are we doing for time? Would you like to come in on it and ask some questions or discuss something? Would you tell your story of emigrating to the United States, how you the, left? How I left? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a good story. My story is good. <laughs> and yet it has all the elements of danger in it. And how you get over danger. I was lucky. I mean, you know, I was informed. I had parents who included me in everything. So, but other parents can do that too. You can all be very good parents. <laughs> if that's what you are. Uh, but encourage even your relatives and whoever you gets into your life to do that, to take it seriously. But weren't you in danger? Am I remembering this wrong? That you were in danger because of a newspaper article? Yeah. That you'd written? So you, when you came, weren't you also escaping... Persecution, really. Oh, I knew about persecution. When the regime changed, everybody was in, in deadly danger. I was, we were uh, vacationing in a small village, and I remember one um, of the soldiers uh, saying to the other one, uh, they don't like this song anymore, which was a revolutionary song. We can't, we are not allowed to sing that song anymore. Um, there was one man who was a veterinarian, and he had a real bad time with the aristocrats who owned everything, who owned the country, owned the land. And they also owned everything that they exported. And they exported milk from tuberculous cows. Mm -hmm. And this veterinarian stopped that. And I remember hearing that one of the aristocrats whose business he essentially stopped uh, said to him, you'll regret this. And uh, I remember that he was the first when they arrested, they tortured, they finally cut his throat, and he died because he had robbed the aristocrats of their privileges and because he did not want tuberculous, children, <coughs> tuberculous milk to be sold to children. I knew that. I've heard that story. Huh? So I knew that doing the right thing sometimes costs your life. Mm -hmm. And you better get into a situation where there is no uh, danger of that kind. Mm -hmm. So when my parents left, I stayed with my grandparents. And I should have been normally angry of not being included. But I wasn't, because it was explained to me that it's hard enough to get away. And if they had a child with them, it would be almost impossible. And it would be bad for all of us. And I wasn't particularly angry about their leaving. I was studying my Swiss books. Uh, again, I mean, you can modify suffering suffering connected with migration. If you include, if you inform, if you 
have everybody involved know what's going on and not come up in the morning and say we are going on a trip today and then trip becomes forever so those are issues that are connected with it and they are psychological they are relational um, it's, it's important okay question yeah you suggested I have a little trouble hearing this morning that's part of the problem so would you you suggested before about parents in the Arab Spring and they don't you know educate yeah. their kids yeah and it, it brought to mind um, a kind of a complacency how things could change so quickly even in this country yeah um, and it brought to mind um, many people who, how a lot of parents don't talk about how their grandparents, say for instance, yeah. or immigrated, and yeah. what were the circumstances of the immigration. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's sad how those uh, lessons are lost and uh, yeah. how complacent people here are. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I fear what's happening, and in fact, Tuesday, I was at the Italian embassy and I had my preliminary approval for dual Italian citizenship through my father, who was an Italian citizen as well as a U.S. Interesting. citizen. Interesting. Because I feel personally I need that flexibility to move yeah. if necessary. But, um, and I don't have any children, yeah. but I'm really amazed how uh, what's going on, how so many people don't make plans yeah. because of the way things are moving so quickly. Yeah, well, they are moving quickly, but, you know, a family meets a couple of times a day maybe for a meal, and maybe they have read the paper, and maybe they say what's in the paper. It's, there's a conversation, hopefully, at a dinner table. Of course, that's another issue, but uh, those are problems that people have, aside from migration. But, but for example... Uh, before World War One, yeah, Germany was a greater industrial nation than Britain. Yeah, people don't know that. In fact, it was the greatest industrial oh, nation. Oh no, no. Well, history is another issue. But it was amazing what had happened in such a short period of time. Yeah, from before World War One, no one would have ever expected that that Germany would have evolved the way it did over such a short period of yeah. time. Yeah, you and your parents must have been just shocked because. It, it dominated so much of the politics as well as the Russian Revolution. But. Well, that was, you know, they were involved in it very actively from my father. Well, that was World War II, World War I, from 14 to 18, 19. Okay. My parents were divorced. When I say my parents, I usually speak about my mother's second marriage and my, my stepfather. They were all involved in it. But I saw my father every Sunday afternoon. And one day he said to me, I won't be able to see you for a while on Sunday afternoons. And I thought that, like everybody else, he would be um, called for service, military service. He didn't say why he wouldn't see me. That was one interesting thing. Uh, I didn't see him again until one day after the after World War I was ended, after every one of the countries involved had a revolution. And I walked into my grandparents' house where I lived, into the living room, and there was my father, my mother, and her second husband. And I said something about my God. By that time, I was 10 years old. And I said, how come the three of you are together? And they said the revolution is more important than personal life. And they work together. So that was something to digest as a child. But they helped me with it, and they did. And each of them had a top job in the government. They were the government. 
So when I was uh, much younger with my father and he said he won't see me for a while, it wasn't that he was called to service, it was that he went underground to start working the revolution, making the revolution. That I found out not too much later, but, but not right then. So there was also a certain amount of pride. It's very important that we respect and love and think well of our parents. In, if you are in analysis, of course, you are sort of encouraged to see the, the negatives too. And of course there were negatives, but they were, again, they were discussed, they were talked about, and not always. Later on, when I was older, of course, there were other things that came up. But again, eventually things were talked about. But I was so involved in the changes. I was so involved, in, and it would be really desirable for every child to feel that they are somehow part of what goes on in the world, that they are not only passive and ignorant and not understanding, but that they have a part in it. And it doesn't have to wait until they are in their twenties. So that's that's for you. Are you hungry? You you have a right to be hungry. <laughs> Anything else you want from me now? I was wondering if you could tell us about your training. In, what? You, could you tell us about your t the training that you undertook in analysis? I'm I know it's a little off topic, but it's so interesting. Well, I, I certainly want future analysts to be aware of the world and aware of what's going on. And as against the old teaching, we were not supposed to talk about what was going on in the world. Uh, when I was trained, my God, you couldn't mention anything that was going on. It was only the in, inner life and the unconscious. And later on there were relationships and that was important. And we learned that the analysis was a two-person experience and not a one-person experience. But but other than that, uh, it was still, you couldn't come in and talk about politics. And if the patient talked about politics, it was usually interpreted as resistance. They don't want to talk about their own problems, they want to talk about yeah. the external stuff. Well, sometimes that was true too, but uh, not always and not exclusively. And people live in this world, and all the events affect the psyche, not only uh, other people's psyche. Uh, every analyst and reads the papers. Every analyst and has a lot of problems about uh, what school to place for the place their children in, and and what to do with relatives who are a problem, and politics that are a problem. I mean, people talk about a lot of things other than their unconscious and their dreams. And their dreams are related to the, to the real events in life. And you can interpret that too. We weren't supposed to interpret that. We were supposed to look for the psyche only. And you know, anything that's dogmatic is bad. Anything that has flexibility is important. And that's really all I can say. And stay aware of what's going on in the world. And right now it's really a daily business.
things happen so fast. And I hope we don't get into a war. Iraq was the worst mistake. And if we get another one like it, I don't know what will happen to us. Okay. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, lunch is ready in the dining room. I had it had something else than she. No, I think I didn't really talk enough about the incredible suffering that people go through. Uh, when they move from one culture to another and how everything is alien and everything is not the way it used to be and how they have missed so many people and in wartime they don't know what happened to the other people. There were people here who were beginning a new life but they, were, they had no way of being in touch with their families. Uh, anybody who was gone for four years of war, little more than four years, um, they had no connection at all. There was some Red Cross. Occasionally you got some information, but um, many times you didn't. And here were all these alien people, and they had different customs, and they were different, and everything was different. And... Uh, uh, you know, Kernberg talks about the expectable environment, mm -hmm. and they had not an expectable environment, and they had no access to very often to the people who were most important. I know we got my husband out the last day before the war, and I remember the letter he wrote to me. They had a layover in Berlin. He went to Sweden from Vienna, and he wrote, he wrote, my God, everybody here is talking about war in Vienna, nobody talked about war, mm -hmm. and save all time magazines for me, I feel like Rip and Wrinkle. Okay, so he got out the last day, mm -hmm. went to Sweden, mm -hmm. and in Sweden, they told him he would sail to the States from Norway. And he didn't know when. He was not told when. One day he was told, uh, we are going to blindfold you, fold you, and we are going to take you to a Norwegian ship. And the Norwegian ship came over totally blackout. They had one smorgasbord that they put out the first night, and that was essentially what they had for five, five days. They sort of added to it. And my husband asked the captain whether the ship was shipworthy. And he said, are you kidding? Do you think we would get our good ships for this? <laughs> Little things like that. But, Eventually we landed in New York and that was fine. And then we were there. He didn't know what happened to his parents. One of them died in a concentration camp. The other one was on the last shipment to Auschwitz. And the sadness and the mourning and all of that was part of the accepting a new life and a new culture. My husband had been in the States before. I had been in the States before. So it wasn't a real strange place. But not everybody was here. And we didn't know about everybody. And we were worried about everybody. I just wanted to mention that, mm -hmm. that that was an additional mm -hmm. issue for people in the recent <laughs> past, where war was essentially the, the cause of migration. Important one. Anyway, okay. So, I will leave you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.